I, I think there was a lot of interest in that last topic, which is always nice to hear. So it's always interesting to see. I feel like every year there's like one topic where there's like 20 questions. So um, that was fun. And it, it does, um, it is worth noting that that's really the most fun part of the job for me has always been that every day is different because every student's different and you never really know what you're going to need to do and how you're going to need to do it in order to help them. Uh, and so it's important to realize how many different things, how many different things we can do as individuals, how many different services we can provide uh, to help our students. We're actually going to talk about one of those services that can be very beneficial now. Um, talking about uh, the needs of the school library program is Emily Sand. Do you want to, uh, did you want to play? Oh, sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, I just want to walk back. Yeah, it, just, just make sure this, it's on the arrow. Oh. So like if it slides off, it might not click. Okay. Yeah, so like you just need to make sure it's there. And okay, then you can just it hold there. it and click. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. This is my first year as a teacher leader. My name is Emily Sand. I am currently the media specialist at Penichuk Middle School. I have been the media specialist for the past five years. And before that, I was a classroom teacher. And I taught at elementary school and I taught at middle school. So I've been through two of the three areas of our national public school system. As a classroom teacher, we had plenty of data. I had assessment data, I had formative assessment data. I had exit tickets. I had um, informal observations. I had a lot of data that I could work with to measure student achievement. And a big shift for me moving into the library program was, where's the data? I have data right now on how many books get checked out or how many kids have kept books past their due date and things like that, but I don't really have data on student achievement. So I wanted to focus on student achievement. So my driving question for this project was, what are the needs of my school library program to make the most gains in student achievement? Yeah. So our media centers have changed over time. If you recall, some of you, back to your yesteryear and days of libraries, um, it was a very quiet space. It was very student-centered. It was all about books. So you went in to get a book or to do some research with a book, and you got your work done, and you stayed quiet, and your mission was accomplished, or you went for study hall, and you are out of there. Now we have switched from teaching to find specific information to teaching kids how to find information. Um, in the last couple of presentations, we talked about how much information there is out there for students to navigate by themselves. And one of my many hats is to teach those kids how to find reliable and dependable information in this information world. So we've switched from being a very student-centered, alone, kids alone in their library program to being an active group library program. So I want to see groups of kids working together. I want noise. I want kids to be collaborating. I want teachers to be collaborating. So it's changed a little bit. I also do a lot with technology. And that's part of our role as librarians is to shift to a more technological age. So I work with students and teachers on building their technology base to um, help them build skills to go through high school and get into college and make the most with the um, materials that they have in front of them, which are digital. So academic achievement and libraries are linked. In the past 15 years, there have been 21 separate studies done in different states on school libraries and achievement. Um, interesting, all, st all of the studies show a direct correlation between strong library programs and higher test scores on achievement tests. So really what they're looking at are 
um, those type of tests that students will take once a year, where you don't have much other data other than that. So that's what all the studies were really focused on. Um, an, interesting, an interesting correlation was the scores increase regardless of poverty level. So something we always think about as teachers is what is the poverty level? How why is this school doing better than this school? What is the poverty level at this school? So we were looking at um, the scores and it was interesting to see that they increased regardless of how the poverty level lies in the school. So as we use the library more, test scores increase. When we're talking about standardized tests and achievement based on standardized tests, we see that overall the test scores rose with relationship to strong library systems, but we also see that looking at proficiency levels, so where students lie, that their scores went up as well. So they're jumping from proficiency level higher when the librarian and the teachers are working together to educate them. Um, I saw some data reported over and over and over. And those statistics largely pointed to libraries have to be staffed. They have to be stocked with resources that kids are going to use and learn from. And these resources have to have a large variety. So we're not looking only at kids who are um, we're not looking at a demographic of kids anymore. We're looking at a very, very, very demographic of kids. So we're looking at kids from many different backgrounds. So we really have to stock libraries to focus on those kids too. So what's a strong media center? A strong media center, according to the research, should have a full-time librarian. In Nashua, we're lucky we have full-time librarians in all of the schools. Um, we also, it is also recommended that there is support staff. And support staff comes in many different capacities. Um, some schools have paraprofessionals and other districts have support staff. Um, we need these people to do a variety of different tasks, including working with kids. So for one person to run the space, it gets, um, it gets interesting when you have many <coughs> classes in or many kids coming in. You need other people to help you run the space. Um, you definitely need an active program of information literacy. So when I'm telling kids how to evaluate information and to look for reliable sources, we need to do that with every single class that comes in and every single student that goes through the school. Uh, we need collaborative and planning time. So we need time to plan with teachers and students, and we need time to embed multi-faceted um, projects and projects across curricula. We need a school library that meets resource recommendations. It's 15 to 20 books per child. So when you're looking at those numbers, it's important to look at budget numbers and to see if your budget actually supports your library. That budget is allocated to be between $12 and $15 per student per year. So our technology is a huge part of this as well. We need that infrastructure to um, be able to support all of the projects we have our kids doing and to facilitate the future endeavors that they have and the, get the basics down. So where are we today? In Nashua. I focused on middle school because I'm a middle school person. Um, the elementary school library program is very, very different. Currently, I do not have any scheduled classes in middle school. I collaborate with teachers and I schedule classes according to my schedule. So we are lucky enough to be able to um, make things happen with UAs. We can make, well, which are unified art classes, so your art, music your tech ed integration, all of that. So I can work with everyone in the building and I can work with every student multiple times a year in the building. Um, each school varies with staffing. So at uh, my school, I have a paraprofessional that works about 20 hours a week. At another school, they have no paraprofessional. 
And at the third school, they have a secretary which does dual duty between the office and the library. Very inconsistent. Our budgets are also inconsistent. Um, they're not the same through schools, which, you know, a couple of the schools have higher numbers, so you would expect that. But they haven't been consistent over time. We've been pretty stagnant. Um, my budget was decreased last year and was increased this year. So it goes back and forth. We don't really have a steady number for what our numbers should be, what our budget should be. Um, technology is a big one. I'm lucky enough to have enough technology for all my students. If I have a full class in there, I have 29 computers for everyone to use. Other libraries in the city have 14 or 10. One library has a computer lab attached to their library. Um, we don't have any space for that. So it's very inconsistent all over the place. Um, and the library <laughs> space is still used for study halls and test locations in some schools. So this is my research design. I investigated a few different things. Um, it talked about how many kids select books independently. Are we still really just the model of single book selection? Are we still just, is that why kids want to come into the library? How many kids are coming in with their classes? What are we looking at when co-teaching and collaborating on projects? How is that affecting our students? Um, and visiting and makerspace usage. I put this into two categories, but they're very, very different. Um, makerspace usage is when kids come in to use a robotics, or they come in to use Legos, or they come in to do something like that. We have a whole table set up. But the visiting is an equally as important part as book selection. I have a lot of students who come to see me that have high ACEs scores. They need connection with an adult, and I tend to be that adult for a lot of kids in our building. So I think that's a really, really important one. Um, utilizing computers, which means they just come in to type something or they just come in to print something and then to just to finish work. So they'll come in and sit at a table and do finish their test or work with their group on a project. <coughs> this was my research de design. And when the kids asked me what I was doing, I said, well, this is my wickedly awesome official data. <laughs> it's just tally marks. I tallied when students came in, and I tallied what they were coming in for. So I, set, I segmented it into three times of day equally, and then I used a tally system for six weeks, <coughs> counting how many kids come in when. So what are we doing well? My results and findings, I was wondering, what am I doing well and what barriers do we encounter or what problems do we have that I can improve my library practice on? Or maybe it's not improvable. <laughs> Here's my findings. Now, I got a lot of data, so I had to cut it down quite a bit. My tally marks, I didn't think, you know, I thought, oh, I'll get some, no, I got a lot of data. Um, so this is the number of students on the left. This was my total six week this was an average six-week amount of time. Um, so most kids are coming in when I'm co-teaching in class. The next highest was for individual book selection. So now we have a juxtaposition of classic library book selection and new age library collaboration. So I thought that was interesting. Now they say that collaboration is important, that they meaning all of the researchers out there. They talk about how teachers gain from collaborating with a librarian and how students gain from collaborating with a librarian. Now this talks about test scores. What we also know is that teachers gain a partner. They gain someone in my case, to help them create the project, to help them create the rubric, to help them grade the project, to sit in parent meetings when the project doesn't go great for students. They have a backup person. And teachers are largely autonomous. They're not used to this. So this ends up being a really great thing for teachers. 
Now students, our most important piece, they gain another expert. They gain someone else to sit with them. They gain someone else to help them to stay after school with. They gain another teacher. So how do we do? 32% of the data was library visits to collaborate with the teacher. I covered five subject areas in grade levels. Now those five subject areas were not just math, science, social studies, English. Um, we covered art classes. This is just in the six weeks. So we covered art classes. We covered science classes. We covered health classes. We covered literacy class. And we covered um, two, two English classes with different grade levels. We, did, we, co we covered all three grade levels. Um, all five different teachers are teachers that I have created projects with over the past three years that have all <coughs> changed their practice around this project to make it better and better and better every year. So all five of those teachers I have worked with to improve this project over the last couple of years. And we had 464 kids impacted out of our 636 kids at our school, just in those six weeks. This was my, I was so excited about the budget findings when I found this data, I was so excited. So the budget recommended per child is 10 to $12 per student. This was the lowest budget that I could find. That was recommended for students. So $4,200 is really close to what I get every year. I was super excited about this data. So 10, I'm looking at my data. I said, I get $4,600. I'm ahead of the norm. <laughs> Until I broke it down. <laughs> so was I. I was all excited for a little while, too. So then I looked at our per student price. And I figured out that my um, periodicals is magazines. So my $4,600 divided by my student enrollment gave me $7.17 per student. So we're a little bit off when it comes to that recommended per student number. Access. The Washington State Library Impact Study um, talks about flexible access to the library and kids coming in. Kids having the freedom to come into the library, get their materials, use their resources, and finish their work. Access comes down to how much your library is open. When I looked at access at our library, I found that the large majority of students are coming in between 10.15 and 12.30. Interestingly enough, my paraprofessional comes in at 10.15. My morning numbers, 8 o'clock to 10.15, are the lowest of all, three data, of all three pieces of data. If my paraprofessional is not there and I have a meeting, I have to close the library. If my paraprofessional is out, then I have to close the library if I have something else that needs to be done within the school. Sometimes I co-teach with teachers in their classroom. Sometimes the technology infrastructure is already set up in their classroom, so I, don't, um, I, I leave the library. And when I leave the library, if no one's there, we have to close it down. So that's an access problem. We're also looking at access to materials per day. So when we look at the disparity between Monday and the rest of the days, it's sort of obvious that something's going on on Monday. Monday is the day that my paraprofessional is not there. So Monday is clearly kids are getting less um, access to their daily independent book checkout. So through my study, I found that 
you know, these factors are important. Kids have to be able to get in. Kids have to find materials that suit them. For my recommendations, I think that all national libraries should have adequate staffing. All national libraries need an increase in budget. We need more databases and reliable sources for kids. In a world of Google, it's a dangerous place. More money, it's going to take more money to allocate to those services, but they are desperately in need. We need professional development. I mean, we say this all the time, but we need time. I need time to collaborate with classroom teachers who are skeptical about collaborating with me. We need time to work with each other. We have a possible impact of $9.52 million coming from the state. I would love to see some of that allocated to our libraries, our school libraries. Thank you.